people perish for lack of knowledge. So the main thing I would say is acquaint yourself with Jesus. Learn what he can do. He not only saves, but he heals. Yes, and he's still alive today. And he wants to heal you. Mm -hmm. He wants you to be well. He died on the cross so that we could have healing and so that we could live an abundant life. If you're sick, you don't have an abundant life. So acquaint yourself with Jesus. Learn about him. Learn about healing. There are so many people that don't have a legacy mm -hmm. that don't that I mean are starting from scratch and let's let's start there tonight we're going to build on and we're going to get to have mama Doty on and 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 all of that but but what 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 words to the people that don't come from the same kind of backgrounds that we've had and are starting over there's a lot of people viewing tonight that probably feel that way I can never do anything because I didn't come from that same kind of legacy. Yeah, it's interesting, man. I thought that same thing when Victoria was talking because, you know, I feel very blessed because I had parents that spoke faith into me, that, that loved me, that loved God, that honored, honored God. But I realized not everybody has that. Some people, you know, meet them all the time. I'm, I'm sure you do too, that they come from, you know, people that they're not necessarily proud of. They love their parents, but there's other things. But I think my, my encouragement to you would be that you can be the one to start the new legacy. Yeah. I mean, you're not hearing this by accident. You could be the one to, to break the addiction or to, to rise higher, whatever held your family down. You know, you, you, God's having you hear this so you can, you know, you can make some changes. You know, I, I think a lot of times, Matt, we, we hear about a generational curse, but we can start a generational Amen. blessing. Amen. I believe that's what God wants us to do. And, you know, we, we, we love those that have gone before us, but I don't believe we're supposed to stay there. And I think sometimes we can, we can let those thoughts play, or especially people that, don't, that weren't raised with people that, that push them forward to say, like you said, you know, I'm not talented. I, I didn't have what you have, Joel. I didn't have somebody speaking faith into me. But nothing that you're facing is a surprise to God. Hmm. God has already equipped you and empowered you. And again, I believe the reason you're hearing this is that you can, faith can be ignited in your heart so you can say, you know what, I'm the one to rise higher. I am going to start a new legacy. I am going to speak faith into my children. I am going to break this addiction. You can be the one to set a new standard. And so that would be my encouragement is to don't get stuck in the past. Say, you know what, I, I will be the, the John Osteen in my family that can speak faith into others. Yeah. In fact, that's what your father did, actually. Yes. Joel's father was the first one in his family to, to know Christ and accept Christ into his life. And he made a decision right then that he was going to raise his children and he was going to represent Christ. So, you know, you, it takes faith. It takes determination because sometimes we, we're, we're plowing the field and we don't always feel like it's changing. Mm. But you've got to know in your heart of hearts that you're making a difference and your life has value and it has purpose. And, you know, I can hear some people out there saying, well, I am the only one in my family who believes. Wow. You know, and, and I've got all these unbelievers around me and it's hard. Well, I would encourage them to keep plowing. You know, the best way to show Christ and to leave a legacy is to leave a legacy of love. Yeah. And I think you can't change people, but you can let God change them. Mm -hmm. You sow the seed, you know, just let your love water the seed and God will bring the increase. But I would just encourage people, don't give up. Know that your life has value. God's got you here for a purpose and a reason and that you are making a difference. I know, can I say one more thing, Matt and Lori too, <laughs> is my, some people are, are raised in a limited environment. So, so my dad grew up during the Great Depression back in the 30s. His parents were cotton farmers and during the Great Depression, they lost all their money when the banks closed and so, my dad, they didn't have money growing up for hardly to have enough food. He could never drink a full glass of milk and just, you know, just very extreme poverty. And at 17 years old, nobody in his family, like Victoria said, knew the Lord. But a friend of his in high school had been witnessing to him and just encouraging him. And, you know, that was so far, to, far out to my dad because there was just no history of faith. But my dad was walking home from a nightclub at 2 o'clock in the morning, 17 years old. And he felt God drawing him. He didn't even know what it was. He walked into the, to the living room that night and they did have a family Bible. You know, they may have prayed at Christmas or something, but there was no faith in there. But he opened the Bible and it fell open to a picture of Jesus standing at a door and knocking. And it said, 
if anyone, um, I, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I'll come in. Well, my dad didn't know anything about religion, but he did know something about opening a door. And so that next morning, he called his friend. They went to church. His friend walked down the aisle and he gave his life to Christ, the first one in his family. And what's interesting is 17 years old, God put a dream in my heart that, that day that my dad would be a pastor one day to thousands of people. And back in the 30s, there wasn't a church of a thousand, you know, church of thousands, but he knew he was supposed to do that. But here's the point I wanted to get to. His parents were great people. They loved God. But they said, you know, basically, John, you can't be a pastor. You don't know how to do anything but pick cotton. He told him he was going to go and, you know, start a church somewhere or go out and start ministering. But they loved him, but they tried to keep him in that same environment. Mm -hmm. At 17 years old, my dad hitchhiked and he went out and started preaching in the senior citizens homes and on the street corners and things like that. And of course, he honored and respected his parents. But if he had let that limited, if he had stayed in that limited environment, I wouldn't be where I am today. Lakewood wouldn't be here. And I think sometimes our environment is limiting us and people, people love us. You know, people that are around you may, may love you and it's always good to honor and respect them. But sometimes God's going to put something in your heart where you have to take a step of faith, yeah. where you have to say, you know what? They're telling me not to, but God, I believe you determine my destiny. And so my dad broke out of the mold. Mm -hmm. and even later in life when he was pastoring Lakewood or when, before he pastored Lakewood, you know, he was pastoring a denominational church and the same thing. It's a, it's a longer story, but my dad took a step of faith and started Lakewood. And I think sometime to really leave that legacy, you have to have a, a holy boldness. You have to be willing to take some risk. When you know God's put something deep down in your heart, don't let people talk you out of it. Don't let doubt talk you out of it. You know, don't let circumstances talk you out of it. Take that step of faith. And I believe you'll see God open doors that you never dreamed would open. And you can leave a legacy of faith, something far greater than you've ever imagined. Yeah. Yeah, more than I ever imagined, Matt. I, I see the, when I look at the picture of the compact center, I always think, and I tell it all the time, but I had season tickets to watch the Rockets when I was in my late teens and early 20s and never dreaming one day that we would own that building. That's why it's so easy to tell, for me to tell people that God's dream for your life is bigger than your own. Yeah. I mean, 21, 22 years ago, never thought I would be a pastor and never thought these doors would open. But again, not bragging on us, just bragging on what God wants to do in your life. Yeah. When you dare to believe, when you honor Him, when you keep Him first place, you don't know where God's going to take you. And even, even me, you know, I thought my dad would ask me to, to come up and minister when he was alive. And I thought, that's so funny because what I, I wouldn't know what to say. You know, I thought I didn't think I could get up in front of people. I'm naturally more quiet and reserved. And, you know, it's, it was so far out to me. But when my dad died, sometimes God will use adversity to push you into your destiny. Right. Wow. I discovered gifts and talents in me that I didn't know I had. I didn't know I could get up in front of people. Even when I first started ministering or a little ways down the road, maybe. At first, I didn't know what I was doing. Still don't know all, totally. But, <laughs> but at first, people would say, oh, man, you're so good. You're, you're, you really know how to minister. I thought, I'm just talking to people. I don't know what they mean. Mm. But, you know, I realized, you know what? Somehow God gave me a, a gift to connect with people. Mm. So I'd say that, not to brag on me, but to let you know there are gifts and talents in you that you have not yet tapped yeah. into. I believe there is potential in you that you're going to see God bring out in a certain way. And I can tell you, it, you, might, it, you may, may try to intimidate you. You may feel like you can't do it. But let me tell you, God wouldn't have given you that opportunity yep. if he had not already equipped right. you and empowered you. Right. When I first started ministering, I was so nervous. I would have to go look in the mirror on Saturday nights and say, Joy, you can do this. You are well able. You are wow. strong in the Lord. Wow. See, I've learned this. You can either talk yourself into your dreams or you can talk yourself out of your dreams. Yeah. I think too many times we're letting those wrong thoughts play. You know, I don't have a big legacy like you, Joel. I didn't get a, I didn't, my dad didn't leave me a church. I don't have all this opportunity. Listen, you have what you need to make yeah. a greater difference. Yeah. So you let that faith rise up in you. And like we're talking about, don't let people talk you out of it. Yeah. Sometimes well-meaning people can say things. If you let that play over and over, it can keep you from your destiny. You've got to tune all that out and say, God, I know you being for me is more than the world being against yeah. me. You keep moving forward, and I believe you'll see the goodness of God in great ways. Amen. You know, I think that's the key, moving forward. Yeah. It's easy to get stuck. Hmm. It's easy to get stuck, but God expects us to be determined. He expects us to use what we have. And, you know, it's great 
when God gives you a vision on the ceiling. But most people don't get that. Right, right. You know, most people have to step out in faith and they look at their resources, they look at their ability and it looks limited. But if God's asked you to do something, He's going to give you that next step. But we have to take that next step. Mm -hmm. And like Joel said, he had to literally talk himself into it. Yeah. Because I know how afraid he was. Mm -hmm. And I know how, you know, when, when someone pushes you into a swimming pool, you better start swimming or you're going to sink. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes we find ourselves at a turn of life or a place we didn't expect. And you know what? We've got to start swimming. We've got to just go for it. And we have to have that confidence. And I think another thing, we're talking a lot about legacy and faithfulness, but faithfulness is about consistency. Yeah. Day in and day out, even if you don't see anything happening, mm -hmm. even if you're tired, you know, you just, you have to believe that, you know, your effort, God's going to crown it with success. And, right. and so it's just about faithfulness and consistency and getting the right people around you as well. You know, we had good people around us. Yeah. And so you, you have to really get yourself in that environment as best as you can. And you have to know that you've got to be your best cheerleader mm -hmm. because you can't expect people to cheer you up. They don't know what you're going through. You know, you've got to be able to, like David, encourage yourself through those difficult times. But the key again is moving forward and being consistent. Yeah. Even when you don't feel like being consistent, you've got to show up at least. Mm -hmm. If you show up, God will tell you what to do. Just show up though. Too many people just don't show up. They're just, they're, they don't think they have what it takes, but you have to show up. Yeah. Beautiful. I think one more thing, Matt, thinking about those, when I see that video and thinking about all that, you know, not bragging on me, but those 17 years I worked behind the scenes, like you guys, you know, I did my best to make my father look good. I'd spend hours working on the lighting and the camera angles. During those 17 years when my dad ministered, I would have to edit the program. He had a half hour program as well, and daddy would speak for like 40 minutes, so I'd have to cut down 10 or 15 minutes out of it. So I'd have to listen to that sermon mm -hmm. maybe four or five different times to get the train of thought. And, you know, he, my dad was extemporaneous, so maybe he was talking here and talking over here, and so I'd put it all back together. Never, never dreaming that really God was getting me prepared for wow. what I'm doing now. Wow. Yeah. I never thought I would be a pastor, but listen, God's, God's getting you prepared for things in the future that you don't even realize right now. Yeah. You would have never talked me into being a pastor, but you know, once I stepped up to pastor, I realized I've got all those sermons in me, all those stories. I had to listen to my dad's train of thought. So it just shows you how God is going to connect the dots in your life. You stay faithful. You keep honoring him. And again, I believe you've already seen it in the past, but what you haven't seen, you know, you haven't seen anything compared to what God's going to do in your future. You keep moving forward and you're going to see the goodness of God in greater ways. Beautiful. Was there ever a time that you just said, I can't do this? I think there was times I felt that way, but I have a, a determination in me to kind of let that, let that stir me to do it. But there were times I thought, I don't know what I can say this week, you know, especially early on because, you know, it was, I look back now and, and realize God gives you grace for every season. Yeah. I was telling my kids the other day, when I look back, I think, how did I preach those first six months? Hmm. I didn't know how long to make a message. I didn't know how to make a message, mm -hmm. but... There were times I thought, I don't know what to say this week. There's times I'd, I'd sit there and write for eight hours and I'd get one paragraph. And I thought, man, it's going to take me seven years to get one sermon. <laughs> but you know what? You just keep pushing through it. And yeah. I, think, I think those are all testing times and proving times. And God saying, in a sense, you know, how bad do you want it? Are you going to stick with it? And so even I was talking earlier about the first 12, 13 years of Lakewood, it started with 90 people. It, it had less than 200 people 12 years later. Mm. It didn't grow. And my dad was a great minister. Yeah. He's a great pastor and yes. he could preach great sermons. But sometimes you're doing the right thing and you're not seeing growth. Mm. Maybe the wrong thing's happening. You think, man, I need to do something different or God, your blessing isn't on this. But when you know it's what God put in your heart, you just got to keep doing it. You just got to keep being faithful and mm. don't compare to somebody else or don't let your thoughts talk you out of it. Because let me tell you, you'll come into a time where 
1972, it was like God opened a door and people came, started coming from Lakewood all over the place, all over the city. I believe you'll come into those times where you'll hit a, a moment, a destiny moment where God will open up new doors and you'll see growth that will make up for all that time that you feel like you're falling behind. Mm -hmm. Listen, one touch of God's favor can yep. put you 50 years down the road. Yep. So you keep being faithful. Yeah. And I think, you know, what's important is, you know, sometimes... You know, especially at the office, you know, you think, well, nobody's giving me credit and everybody's, you know, people leaving me out. They're playing politics. But you got to realize you are not working under people. You're working under God. Right. Promotion doesn't come from people. It comes from the Lord. And I've learned this. When it's your time to be promoted, all the forces of darkness cannot stop what God has in store for you. Yes. People can't stop him. Your boss can't stop him. I mean, we saw that with the, with the Compact Center, Matt, when, Lori, when God opened that door, we had all kinds of opposition, big companies against us. But you know what? <laughs> it's like David versus Goliath. Yeah. What God has ordained for you is coming your way. Thank yeah. you, Lord. You just keep being faithful. And we saw, you know, companies that, that should have got the Compact Center, but through the favor of God and through God changing people's minds and just uh, supernatural things, it, it fell into our hands and... Here we are, never dreaming we would own a basketball arena. Uh. We've been talking about legacy, and the best way to talk about that is to bring you here. Here you are. Yeah, you no, are a, <laughs> yeah, you're still here, thank God. So basically, you were the beginning of a legacy that we're experiencing. We've been talking with Joel and Victoria. Uh, there was a time when you needed to tap into a level of faith that doesn't get talked about maybe enough uh, today. You were given a, and handed a diagnosis that was really a death sentence, okay? And um, there could be people that are in that same situation that clicked in right now, mm -hmm. they're here. Tell your testimony. We know that God, if he does it for one, he intends to do it for more. Just tell your story a little bit, Mama. Well, it was in 1981, Matt and Laurie, that I was diagnosed with liver cancer. I mean, I'd been healthy. Joel saw me. I rode a big tractor mower when we were living out in the country. And I, I loved working outside. I did all the work. I did hard work. I labored from the time I sent them off to school in the morning till <laughs> the time I went to bed. Sometimes I was up shampoo in the carpet when they all went to bed at night so they wouldn't walk on in the daytime <laughs> but anyway i was just diagnosed i just went in the hospital paul said our son paul who's eight years older than joel was in medical school and i went to his to graduation from medical school and he said mother you look a little bit older than i expected you to look and you're a little bit jaundiced i think you need to go check be checked out and i knew i'd been tired but i didn't think about that we had a big conference coming mm. and so i went and called the doctor and he said, well, just come in and let me check you out. He said, I said, can I go? Because I have a conference next week. And he said, well, he said, no, you'll have to stay in the hospital at least two or three days. So I said, okay, I'll go. So I ended up in there 20 days mm -hmm. and it was right before Christmas time. And I never expected the diagnosis of cancer of the liver. I thought it would be just some simple little thing. And then when he said, it's something to do with your liver, I thought, well, maybe when I had gone with John overseas to some of the countries, I picked up a parasite or, or something simple. But when he said that I had cancer of the liver, he met John in, downstairs coming up to my room. And he said, and oh, we don't have anything to do for her. She may take chemo. Then it was different 36 or seven years ago. I was 48 at the time. My mm -hmm. goodness. And I'll be 86 in October. Wow. <laughs> so see how good God was. So John said, well, when he, we found that out, it was on the 20th day after they'd done every test on the, on, under the sun. And I was so tired and weary. But I want to let you know that we went home and we laid on the floor. I went to, I didn't go to bed right away, but I went to bed at night when it was regular time. And we got up the next morning and we laid on our faces at the foot of our bed. And he prayed, and I never will forget what he said. He said, Jesus, heal my wife. And he said, and he prayed and cast the, the devil out, you know, the demon forces of cancer. Uh, Jesus spoke to the fig tree, it withered and died. He said, I command the cancer command cancer to leave her body. And you know what? As far as I was concerned, it left that day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it didn't seem like it left that day. Mm -hmm. But anyway, and he said, I need her, Jesus. 
The church needs her, Jesus. Her mother and daddy need her. The children need her. And Jesus, you need her. And so I just said, I got up from the floor. That was December the 10th. And I, my Bible was, stand, was on the, f the foot of the bed. And I, got, I said, Jesus, would you mind if I stood on the Word of God? And I put it on the floor. And I thought, well, would Jesus be pleased if I stood on His Word? <laughs> and then I thought, I don't think He'll care. I think He'll be proud of me. So I put that Bible on there. And with my little foot that had polio, I put those little feet on there. And I said, Jesus, I'm standing on Your Word. Mm -hmm. So I went around the house saying, December 11th, I believe Jesus healed me. December 11th, I believe everybody would say, how are you, Miss Dodie? I never said, I feel bad. You know, I don't feel good. I just said, I'm blessed. Jesus healed me, December 11th, 1981. And so I kept on saying it, and I'm telling you, it was just wonderful how God helped me. And that's when I started praying for other people. Don't you think, Joel? Yeah. And now I still do, and I love praying for people. That's my life, it's praying for people. So you, you what, what was the principle of what you were doing in case somebody just, again, doesn't have a legacy, doesn't, doesn't know what to do. A diagnosis has been handed to them. They really don't know what to do. What were you doing in simple terms and explain that to our audience? Well, Jesus still heals. He said, Jesus, uh, Jesus said, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, Hebrews 13, 8, 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I knew he hadn't changed. We, at one time, were in a denominational church. My husband was brought up another denomination, but he went away to a hotel in Houston, and he said, I'm not coming back until I learn more about what Jesus can do for you. Mm -hmm. and, and we had a little girl that was born, Lisa. Our daughter was born with a birth injury. She would have been in a wheelchair, but if it were not for God. Mm. So I just took God at His word. The main thing I would say was acquaint yourself with Him, God and His Son Jesus, it says in Job 22, and be at peace. So we began to acquaint ourselves with Jesus more about healing. Some people don't know, have knowledge of healing. People perish for lack of knowledge. So the main thing I would say is acquaint yourself with Jesus. Learn what he can do. He not only saves, but he heals. Yes. And he's still alive today. And he wants to heal you. Mm -hmm. He wants you to be well. He died on the cross so that we could have healing and so that we could live an abundant life. If you're sick, you don't have an abundant life. So acquaint yourself with Jesus. Learn about Him. Learn about healing. And then take God's Word as it is written. It is written, and He will never go back on His promises. Sometimes we break our promises to people. Sometimes I do. I don't intend to, but I do. Jesus would never break a promise to us. He always will keep His Word. So whatever you need from God, ask Him. Just ask Him and Jesus will do it for you because He has no favorites and He will do it for you. He loves you with an everlasting love. Mm. Um, Joel, um, the, the idea of this sometimes doesn't get talked about enough in our generation. Um, the, you know, the, the healing of, of a body, this, the, you know, you're, you're, you're living proof living testimony. That, that when Jesus said he would do it, you just have to ultimately start believing it right. and help somebody that says when you're sick and you say you're not sick, you're just basically, you know, trying to avoid the problem. What, what do you say to that? Yeah, I don't think it's denying that. I don't believe in denying the problem, but I just tell people to agree with what God says about you. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's what my, my mom, one part you didn't tell mom is, is every, she got a list of scriptures that every day she went over and over healing scriptures. I still scriptures. do, 38 she still years does it now. I don't leave the house without so, reading. So sometimes we're leaving early in the morning. My mom will do it at 12.01 at night. So she's done it for that day. But she takes those, she takes, she says she takes that, those scriptures are like her medicine. They are. So I just, I would encourage people, you know, you can say, well, you know what? I, the medical report's bad and I don't feel good and it's not, or you can say, you know what? I, I believe I, uh, God is restoring health back into me. Yes. I will live and not die. I'm strong in the Lord and the power of His mind. Yes. I believe you have to receive the healing in your mind, in your spirit, before it'll take place in your body. Yes. You can't have your mind and your spirit fighting your body. So, 
I would rather, even, even the saints of old, it says they died in faith. Yeah. I would rather die in faith, die believing that, that healing is coming. If it, if it doesn't come here, it's going to come there. But it's that fact of just, I think a lot of times we just accept it. Hey, man, the doctor said this, and this is what the diagnosis is, and, you know, that's what's going to happen for me. Well, I believe you can give birth to that as well. You can, you know, you can let that keep you from your destiny. So. I think it's more than just being positive. It's getting God's Word on the inside right. of yes. you, agreeing with what He says. Yes. And you know what? I'm going to live and not die. And, you know, uh, God is restoring health back unto me. And just that, that attitude of faith on the inside, not giving up, not, not letting, all, with all respect, doctors don't have the final say. God has the final yeah. say. God can do what medicine cannot do. That's so right. get that down on the inside. I even like this thought too is, you know, don't see yourself as a sick person trying to get well. I'm a well person fighting off sickness. Yeah. That's who God created me to be. I'm not an addicted person trying to get free. I'm a free person fighting an addiction. Yeah. I think you have to talk to yourself all through the day. You know what? I am healed. I am whole. I am healthy. I am strong. I am energetic. Again, with long life, God will satisfy me. That's a long answer to one question. There it was. <laughs> That's so, a good answer. Last, uh, last question, Mama. If you came from a traditional church background that didn't talk about gifts of healing and gifts of the Spirit, so you came from a denomination that yes. just didn't teach that, do you find that it was easier for you to confess your healing or were you having to you weren't having to unlearn anything, or were you? No. I you just didn't know anything didn't about know anything it. About, when we went to the hospital, we would pray, God, if it's your will, heal this person and make them well. We didn't know that it was God's will already, that wow. He wanted them well. So we had to change our way of praying when we went to the hospitals. Yeah. So, so for you, you basically just took the word at face value. You was either that or death. Yeah. You know, well, so I wanted wow. to live. Wow. I tell you I what. I wanted to live to be an old yeah. lady. Yeah. <laughs> I'm old now, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, if you're sick, I want the number one person I want to call and pray for me is Dodie. Mama, would you pray for Just people pray right for the, now? I would pray be for glad to. I would. Be Father, I pray. Anybody here that has anything wrong in their bodies, just lay, lift your hand, would you please? Father, Thank I pray you. for the people here tonight and the people watching. Jesus, some of them need miracles, yes. and they need big-time miracles, yes. Jesus. And Father, you have no favorites. Mm -hmm. You're in the miracle work in business. Yes, so I ask you to do a miracle in the name of Jesus, that name that never changes and never will change. I speak to every sickness and disease that's represented among these people tonight here and that are in the viewing audience, and I command it to wither and die and leave just like Jesus spoke to the fig tree. I speak to it, and I I say every root of you leave their bodies in Jesus' name. Father, let regeneration come. Give corrective miracles, creative miracles, whatever they need, Father. Just give them a miracle. Some of them are laying on their beds now dying, Father. They have no hope, but you are their hope. Thank and you, they need to know that you are their hope. So I speak to diseases. I command them to leave and forever leave and never, ever come back the second time in Jesus' name. Now, God, do miracles. And I I pray that people will write in and say, we got healed and they will serve you, Father, all their days, Jesus. And they will tell others about you, Father. And Jesus, they will pray for other people and they will see miracles. Jesus, you don't even have to have anybody pray for them because you're right there with them in their hearts, in their homes, in their hospitals. Jesus, may peace come and tormenting spirits and fear leave those people and may the peace of God that passeth all understanding guard their hearts and minds. Now, Father, we expect for you to have people write in and tell them, or call and tell them, Jesus, that I was healed on that night when you all took time to pray. And Jesus, we gladly pray for you. We, for them, Jesus. That's our life, Jesus, is to pray for others. And we want these ministers, everybody look at your hands, would you? May the anointing of God come into their hands. And I pray as they lay hands on sick people in their churches, as people lay hands on sick people here, as uh, Laurie and Matt lay hands on sick people. They'll see miracles and signs and wonders. Yeah. And Jesus, we even want to see people come out of wheelchairs, Father. And we want to see people raised from the dead like they see in Nigeria and other places, Father. 
God do miracles yes. because you're a miracle worker and we believe that you will <laughs> never, ever, ever change. And all the people said, Amen. 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 TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.